Everybody loves an NPC shopkeeper in D&D, but what if instead of just befriending them for discounts, you could actually play as one? A traveling merchant, on the road with an adventuring party, always ready with whatever items they need. Well, Terran Pounds, known on YouTube as Indestructo Boy, has an answer. The Merchant, a support spellcasting class. And I gotta tell you, it's been a long time since I've felt as excited about the potential of a class as I felt reading over this one. Not only does it allow for a ridiculously wide variety of interpretations, but it also has a really cool and unique core mechanic mechanic that is unlike any other D&D class. That's why I chose it for today's video, which is sponsored by DMs Guild. DMs Guild is a community content program where creators can legally use official D&D material to create and share their own game content, from adventures and character options to monster collections and magic items. There are thousands of PDFs, all created by DMs like you, to help improve your games and make your job easier. Make sure to use my code for a discount on your DMs Guild purchase, whether or not that includes the merchant. Learn more in the description. Today, we're going to look in detail at the merchant class, which includes a staggering 11 subclasses, each with their own unique flavor and role in the party. If you think the merchant might be a good fit in your game, hopefully this video will help you decide. And if not, maybe it'll at least give you some fun NPC ideas. On a basic level, the merchant is described as a spellcasting support class, and I think that's more true for the merchant than it is for almost any other class normally described as support. Most of their abilities are practical, not martial, and out of their entire spell list, I can count the spells that deal damage on one hand. Whether they're helping their fellow adventurers with guidance or featherfall or dark vision, or controlling the battlefield with hold person counterspell, or slow, almost every spell on the merchant list is about solving problems and buffing the party. But the true core of the class is in their easy access to items. Need ammunition for a ranged weapon? You're now traveling with a reliable supply. Rations? Covered. Want daily access to holy water, healing potions, bombs, basic poison? Thanks to the merchant, you can buy one a day. Indefinitely. With some restrictions, of course. What, you thought it would be free? I'm a merchant, not a charity. Gotta get that bread, as they say. It's a very common problem in D&D that once parties start to reach higher levels, they have way more money than they'll ever spend. Apart from providing useful access to items, this class also gives the party something practical to do with their accumulated riches. This feature, the true core of the merchant class, is called the portable storefront. This is probably my favorite part because it's so darn whimsical. A merchant gets to choose any closable container, maybe a classic traveling merchant's oversized backpack, or a steamer trunk, or whatever suits their style, and designate it as their portable storefront. It's magic, and acts a bit like a bag of holding, in that it can carry any number of items while still only weighing 10 pounds. You simply reach into it and think of the item you want. But just like a bag of holding, you can't just pull out anything you can think of. It has to be in stock. When you take your first level in merchant and create your portable storefront, you choose your supply list. This is a list of items of your choice that don't exceed the total storefront value and rarity limit for your level. For example, at level 1, your storefront can only hold 50 gold worth of common items. That could mean that you have dozens of cheap items like paper, rations, arrows, and rope, or just a handful of more expensive items like acid, holy water, or ink. It could even mean that you stock one single healing potion. It's entirely up to you how to allocate that budget. As you level up, your storefront grows. So by level 10, you can stock a thousand gold worth of items. You also unlock something called the Top Shelf, which allows you to stock a handful of higher rarity items that ignore your total storefront budget. Of course, just because something is in stock doesn't mean it's infinite. If you take an item out of the storefront and don't return it in the same state within the hour, you'll have to restock it. To do so, just pay the value of the item in gold into the storefront before a long rest. So if you drink that healing potion, it'll cost you 50 gold to get another one. But you don't have to travel back to town to do it, and as long as you have the money, you're guaranteed to get the item. You can also change your supply list over any long rest, as long as the item you're changing out is in stock. You can prepare items based on what the party is planning on doing, maybe stocking rope, pitons, and grappling hooks before venturing into the mountains, and then swapping those items out for snowshoes and cold weather clothing before you explore the peaks the next day. At level 10, you get a really cool feature called Backstock, where you can reach into the portable storefront and try to pull out an item that is not on your supply list. To find it, you need to roll at or below your merchant level 
on percentile dice. It's basically divine intervention, but for shopping. The only flaw in this system that I can pinpoint is that magic items don't have firm, defined prices, which means that once you reach levels where you can afford to include magic items, creating your supply list may end up being more like a conversation with your DM than it is selecting from a list of items. But honestly, I think the fact that magic items don't have firm prices is more of a flaw with 5th edition than a flaw with this particular class. For DMs who don't want to deal with individually pricing out magic items for a merchant player, I would suggest just grabbing the magic item rarity table from the DMG and making a call that suits your game. So if magic items aren't super unusual, maybe you just say, if the table says 50 to 100 gold, it costs 50. Or if you want a little more nuance, just download one of the many magic item price lists that people have created online. I know Kassoon.com has one, and there's also a PDF created by Sidoro called Sane Magic Item Prices that I really like. However you decide to handle it, just communicate with your player about it up front so they know what limitations they're operating under. Like any casting class, the merchant has a complete spell list, which includes spells from official D&D, as well as a few spells that are original to this supplement or pulled from other third-party creators' work. Each subclass also gets an additional spell list, but it's when the merchant isn't using their spell slots for casting that this class really does something unique. Instead of spending their spell slots on casting, they can use those slots almost like currency, breaking them down into smaller spell levels, handing them off to another caster, or even using them to subsidize material components. Just like you could exchange exchange one gold piece for 10 silver, the merchant can exchange spell slots for equivalent lower level slots. They could swap one third level slot for three first level slots, or for one first level and one second level. They can also transfer a spell slot to another caster just by touching them. And if one of your allies uses a spell that calls for a material component, you can use your reaction to expend a spell slot of the same level to take the place of that component. Ugh, but it's my last spell slot. How about this? I'll give you the spell slot, and you give me your fingernail clippings for the next two months. What does it matter what I'm gonna do with them? Do you want the spell slot or not? I think this spell slot bartering is such a cool idea to bring the economics of the merchant into the way they use magic. And since many of the spells on the merchant spell list have really specific use cases, there may come a time when other casters have already used up their resources and the merchant's unused spell slots might be more effective in somebody else's hands. It's kind of the ultimate support caster move, to be honest, and I'm obsessed with it. Okay, we've finally gotten to the good part, subclasses. For the merchant, this is called your guild. Terran has gone hard on this section with 11 different options, and more than anything, reading through them showed me that you could play a merchant in a million different ways. There are a lot, so I'm gonna summarize them as efficiently as I can. There's the architect, who can conjure magical walls and get spells like Liaman's Tiny Hut and Stone Shape. The blacksmith, who can craft and even enchant weapons and armor. The esotericist, who specializes in arcane goods and can detect and even duplicate curses. The Gambler, who has an incredibly cool mechanic that utilizes a real deck of cards, which I could make a whole separate video about, to be honest. The Gourmand, who cooks magical food that buffs the party. The Mariner, who would really only be practical in a seafaring campaign, but would be awesome in that context. The Pet Dealer, who gets a familiar and can summon and domesticate beasts, and even aberrations or monstrosities at higher levels. The Potion Seller, who can craft potions and restock them at half price. The Swindler, who's basically a a cross between a rogue and a merchant, the toy maker who can animate their own little toy army, and the vagabond who's just broadly suited to travel and survival. The character I created for this video is an esotericism merchant. I picked this class because well, let's be real, it's because I have an addiction to spooky weirdos, but also because it allows for a true arcane specialty that really appeals to me. I think this would be a great subclass for a dark, horror-themed campaign like Curse of Strahd, where the themes this subclass deals with have a higher likelihood of coming up in-game. First things first, this subclass gets a few more combat-ready spells, like Hex and Phantasmal Force, as well as some practical ones that are more thematic to esotericism, like Banishment and Remove Curse. At third level, when you pick your subclass, you get a feature called Eye for Curses, which gives you 
you proficiency with Arcana and Jeweler's Kits, but also gives you a chance to identify when an item is cursed while casting Identify, which all merchants get as a ritual at level 2. You also get a feature called Page Master that gives merchants a really interesting way to interact with spell scrolls. You can place a spell scroll of any rarity into your portable storefront for storage. While it's in there, you can prepare and cast this spell as if it were a merchant spell without consuming the scroll. And of course, you can always pull the scroll back out and use or sell it as normal. At 5th level, you get Occult Sagacity, which gives you insight into others' spell casting. When you witness someone casting a spell, you can use your reaction to roll an Arcana check against their spell save DC. If you succeed, you learn what the spell is, what the caster's spellcasting ability is, and you gain advantage on any saving throws against their spells for one minute. I think this is such a clever feature because it really embodies the flavor of this subclass as an Arcana expert, and in a way that gives the player an opportunity to be really strategic if they want to, especially when combined with spells like Hex or Bestow Curse. At 9th level, you get a feature called the Patronage of Patrons, and it gives you the ability to temporarily protect yourself from mind reading, divination spells, and telepathic messages. This is one of those features that could be more or less useful depending on the campaign and how much your DM is paying attention to your class features when designing the challenges that you'll face. Finally, at 15th level, you unlock the feature Curse Scribe, which I absolutely love. Identify now automatically reveals whether or not any item is cursed and the properties of that curse. Also, you can attune to a cursed item and choose not to be cursed by it. But the best part is, you can also basically clone a curse across multiple items. In the rules as written, there isn't a way for player characters to create cursed items, so I think this is a really exciting feature. I want to curse stuff so bad. For cutting me off with your carriage so grand, each time that you drink you'll taste mouthfuls of sand, and for one whole year by my arcane command, no lover will have you but your own right hand. <laughs> If you're sold on the merchant class, pun intended, you can pick it up on DM's Guild at the link in the description. It's normally $9.95 for the PDF and $19.95 for the print book, but it's actually 25% off through the end of the month, so it's even cheaper right now. Terran also has two other homebrew subclasses which are equally inventive and thoughtful. The Dancer, which is sort of like a rogue meets bard martial support class, and the Alchemist, which goes way beyond what the Artificer subclass offers and is a must-buy for anyone who's into alchemy as a fantasy trope. You can get all three of these subclasses as a bundle, and I'll put that link in the description as well. Finally, don't forget to use my code to get a discount on your purchase. Instead of discounts and sales, my shop has a loyalty program, so after your 10th purchase, you get a free human skull.